Nanoengineering is the exploitation of structures and phenomena that occur on the size scale of roughly 100 nanometers or less. And there are two kinds of nanoengineering. There is flask nano, and there is wafer nano. Flask nano is stuff like COVID vaccines. Wafer nano is stuff like micro, that's a mu for micro, electronics. Flask nano could be something like paint or coatings. Paint or coatings, things that have nanoparticles in them, whether they be polymer nanoparticles, particles of dyes, particles of light absorbers, sunblocks, anything that's like nano in a dispersion, nano in a, in a solution. That's what we mean by flask nano. Wafer, wafer, what's something that could be equivalent to this kind of coating technology? What about cloaking devices? Whether or not a true cloaking device has ever really been achieved is kind of up for debate. I would argue that um, some optical nanoscientists have gotten pretty close in some aspects, but these are structures where we are putting particles exactly where we want them to be on a wafer. There aren't very many particles, but we know exactly where they are. So picture like we're designing a circuit or something and we know exactly where all of these little transistors and wires are. Whereas on this side, we're talking about particles. Here's some liquid here and these are particles in a flask. There, one is not better than another. They follow a lot of the same physics, engineering, and chemis, chemical principles, but there are differences in, the, in what we can do with these types of particles. One question I get is, how is nanoengineering different from other fields in the physical sciences and natural sciences and engineering. So let's go through them uh, bit by bit. How do we derive fundamental knowledge from these other fields? And then how do we apply what we've learned to benefit those other fields? So let's take the natural sciences. That's physics, chemistry, biology. So in physics, we have size confinement. So there are two aspects of size confinement that are important. One is continuum or mathematical effects of size confinement. Now, say you have a cube and you shrink it down and its surface area decreases in proportion to, uh, to one over or sorry, surface area decreases in proportion to the edge squared, roughly. And the volume decreases in proportion to the edge cubed, if it's just a cube, so squared and cubed. If you take the ratio of surface area to volume, you get the R in squared in the top cancels out and you get R uh, to the third, and two out of those three of the third cancel out. So you've got, uh, you've got R squared over R cubed equals one over R, right? So the surface area to volume decreases in proportion to one over R. Now that means that with really, really small R's, your surface area blows up relative to the volume. And that's true whether or not we consider that these particles actually have atoms of which they're made. It just comes out of the math. And it's not even simple, it's not even hard math like calculus. It's just division, right? It's just a ratio of surface area to volume. So that's one way that physics 
and nanoscience uh, interact. In chemistry, you have the foundation of nanoscience being, uh, nanostructured materials being made of molecules. You make them using chemistry. They interact using rules of chemistry, particularly intermolecular forces like Van der Waals, Coulombic uh, interactions, and uh, entropic effects, which we will get to in another lecture. If you think about biology, so how does biology interact with nanoengineering? Well, biology, I think the most important thing is that biology is a natural proof that nanoengineered systems are possible to engineer and to engineer really uh, really sophisticatedly. So some of you might have seen a video on YouTube about a ribosome, how, how it's reading the mRNA molecules, and then all those little individual mRNA synthetases are coming in, and they, are, um, they have the anticodon to the mRNA, and they're stitching together this polypeptide chain that once it's released, eventually forms this three-dimensional uh, protein, which itself, or enzyme, which itself is like a nanostructured machine. And through all of that, it creates all of biology through these little nanostructured interactions, these kind of little biological molecular assembles. So biology is like a proof that nanoengineering is, uh, it's possible to, to do um, enormously complicated things and enormously impactful things with nanoengineering. Let's look at the engineering side of things. How does nanoengineering fit in with the traditional engineering disciplines? So let's take material science and engineering. So to a zeroth order approximation, when we're talking about nanoengineering, we are fundamentally talking about nanostructured materials. Now, nanostructured materials have a lot of differences from conventional materials, like bulk materials, big materials. Remember that word, bulk. Bulk means big. It means everything inside, everything away from the surface. We have surface properties and bulk properties. And traditional material science is largely concerned with bulk properties, phase transitions, kinetics of, of, uh, of phase transitions, kinetics of reactivity, um, uh, working strategies. So how do you, uh, what is the difference between the microstructure inside a material that you get by working a metal with like a hammer versus casting it from a melt into a mold versus machining a metal with a drill or with a saw or with a lathe, which is a tool that you use um, that uses rotational motion to carve bits off of a, uh, of a long piece of metal. Think about the way that a baseball bat might be fabricated. Nano-engineering nano is concerned with what happens when you take a bulk material and you shrink it down to size so that the surface properties begin to dominate. Not only the surface properties, but also effects of size confinement takeover and also intermolecular and interparticle and surface forces play a much bigger role when you shrink these particles down. Picture like a sandcastle. So does a sandcastle work with if you have big rocks, can you make a big a sand castle out of big rocks? No, it's because when you shrink down these sand particles, you shrink the surface area, and those capillary menisci, we'll get to that in a later lecture, those menisci that form between these individual grains of sand become very powerful and uh, when the masses of the particles are shrunk down to size. How about chemical engineering? So chemical engineering is all about transport and fluids and kinetics of chemical processes and separations. All of those things are intimately tied to nanoengineering. If you want to separate particles on the nanoscale, you need a, uh, to, to, in a chemical engineering application, you need to nanoengineer that porous surface. If you need to make a new kind of catalytic converter or even make an old kind of catalytic converter, the power of that catalytic converter is infinitely, uh, is intimately tied to the nanostructure of those little uh, slats in there that, that, that uh, through which the 
gases are uh, are pushed, kind of looks like a honeycomb with a lot of pores in it. And those little nanostructured catalyst particles of rhodium, palladium, uh, platinum that affect the uh, the catalytic conversion are, uh, are are by definition nanoscaled. How about mechanical engineering? Well, we talked a little bit about size confinement, but there is a field of of mechanical engineering called microelectromechanical systems. It's a, a, a way in which accelerometers and sensors in your smartwatch or your phone uh, or your laptop um, sense little deformations um, uh, and they're made using the techniques of silicon micro and nano fabrication that nano engineers use all the time. And Moreover, the effects of size confinement are directly applicable to mechanical engineering and vice versa. Um, another example of size confinement, so the, the classic example is the, the diameter um, to, I'm sorry, the uh, strength to weight ratio of a muscle or the leg of a chair or the leg of an elephant versus a flea where the uh, where the strength of a of a muscle or a leg of a chair scales with its cross-sectional area so the mass of the elephant scales with the cube of its linear dimension, like take the radius of an elephant, and the strength of the leg scales with its cross section. And so you need a much thicker leg for a larger animal to hold it up. How about bioengineering? Well, in bioengineering, you have nanoengineered solutions all the time. Uh, think of the COVID-19 vaccines. Those are encapsulated in nanoparticles, which, um, which travel through the body using, using pharmacokinetics that can be derived from, uh, from nanoengineering principles. Electrical engineering, there's a very close correlation between the development of nanoengineering and electrical engineering, particularly in the form of, uh, of microelectronics. So if you look at uh, Moore's law, which predicts that the density of transistors or the transistor size or reduction in cost scales non-linearly with, uh, with the time so that the d transistor density doubles approximately every 18 to 24 months in, in, um, uh, in a microprocessor. The innovations that allow that to, be, to happen in photolithography and semiconductor processing and thin film deposition, those are all fundamentally nanoengineering uh, innovations. So I hope I've given you a flavor at how nanoengineering is really at the center of the natural sciences and engineering, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.